morning, everyone. It's so good to see you today. And it is time for us to begin our Bible study hour. So let's all grab our Bibles and turn to the book of Titus. The book of Titus, chapter 2. We're about finished with chapter 2, and hopefully we'll wrap it up sometime this morning. And then we will proceed on into chapter 3. So let's go ahead and have a word of prayer together. And then we will begin our Bible study in Titus chapter 2. So thank you for everyone being here this morning. And uh, for all of our visitors who are here today, we welcome you. And we thank you for being here also. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the night's rest. We're grateful, Father, for uh, the blessing of being able to have time this weekend to be with our families as, as we have been with them and, and to enjoy the end of the summer. We're grateful, Father, that you have blessed us through this summer and we know that tomorrow our kids go back to school here in Boston and that that will also be coming up soon for many other children. We pray, Father, your blessings on our children here in this community and all the surrounding communities. We pray, Father, that you be with our teachers and all of our school uh, people who work in various different areas that you would be with them and bless them. Help them, Father, as this new school year begins to do a good job of educating our kids and to help them to learn how to proceed through life. Father, as we have opportunity, we pray that you would help us to share the gospel with those who are around us, and especially those who are in various schools and also with the children that we have opportunity to interact with. We're very thankful for those opportunities. We pray, Father, that you would help us to be good examples. Help us to strive to live for you each and every day. To put you first in our lives so that we can be your friend and that you would be our friend. Father, we are grateful for your son, Jesus, and for the love that He had for us and the sacrifice that He made on the cross for us that through Him we might have hope of eternal life. Father, we thank You so much for Your Word and for this opportunity to study it together. We pray that as we study, You would help us to learn and to grow and to help us to understand and apply so that we can live the kind of life You want us to live teach others that as well. Please forgive us of our sins and help us to love you and to love one another. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Last week we were in Titus chapter 2. We studied verses 11 and 12 and we were talking about the grace of God that brings salvation. All men has appeared teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world, or in this present age, some translations say. And we were talking about that verse and the meaning of it, how that grace teaches, Jesus represents grace for us today, and we have His Word, and so Jesus through His Word teaches us today and as we look to the Word, we look to Jesus and His example and His life, and we seek to have uh, a relationship with Him based upon the grace that He has given us. And we're, we, we should be thankful for that wonderful relationship that we have with Him through His grace, through His teaching, because without it, we would... Uh, you know, I don't think many of us really, because we have experienced God's grace and forgiveness and mercy and love, uh, many of us haven't really experienced, other than those who have been converted later in life, really haven't experienced um, 
what it means to live in the world without God's grace very much. And I know there's some who have, but I'm just using myself as an example. I've been a member of the church all of my life. Um, I was baptized when I was very young, and before that, uh, was brought to Bible class from, an, from the time of infancy, you know. And I've had a tremendously blessed life, you know. And I have not had a lot of turmoil that the world brings when you engage in that kind of activity. And you can see that in the lives of other people, but we really don't experience that those of us who've been raised in the church, so to speak, because we've, we've been the recipients of God's grace <laughs> and the blessings that are associated with that grace. And it's just su such a wonderful respite to be in the church. And I don't, I don't know how many of us who are in the same situation that I'm in how we really, if we really appreciate the fullness of that. I know we can appreciate it to some degree, but not as much as, say, people who were steeped in sin and, and, and with the turmoil that goes along with that in the world, and then how then that impacts life. Uh, being full of fear and full of... Uh, worry constantly and many other things. So that's not to say that members of the church don't have problems. I'm not saying that at all. We do. We all have our own problems. But it's just so much better to be part of the body of Christ than to live in the world. And that's that's what that's what Paul is seeking to convey here in these verses. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present age. Paul was dealing with people here through Titus who were described in chapter 1 as being um, slow bellies and quick tempered and, and uh, idle talkers. There's many who are insubordinate, verse 10. Uh, always liars, verse 12, lazy gluttons, evil beasts. You know, these are the kind of people that are being converted to Christ now. And they need instruction on how to live correctly. And so that's, that's what Paul is saying. That grace teaches us. Grace is God's favor toward us. And this book right here is God's favor toward us in that it helps us to learn how to live a grace-filled life toward others. And being the recipient of that for all the years that I have been has been a wonderful blessing and I'm so thankful for the church. So when we talk about grace and we talk about these things, there's a very real application that's associated with it. It's not just some kind of, of a theoretical concept. Um, it's a true application. It's a true practical thing that of which a lot of times I think we as men of the church take, take it for granted. And we just don't appreciate it or don't see it uh, because we are sheltered. And we are hedged in a lot. Um, and we should be grateful for God's grace. For sure. Well, verse 13, uh, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. So it just gets better, right? <laughs> is in essence what Paul is trying to communicate here. We get a life of grace, which entails a relationship with Jesus and wonderful instruction for how to live life and the blessings that are associated with living that life. We get that life of grace 
But then we also get this wonderful hope. The hope of being able to see Jesus Christ personally one day when He returns. Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. And so Paul expresses in this verse the future expectations that Christians have in their relationship with God. And that expectation is to see Jesus coming back and then to be the recipients of eternal life with Him in heaven forever. And that is even better. So grace, God's grace doesn't stop giving when this life is over. It continues on into the next. And we continue to be recipients of that grace as the future opens itself up to us and we move forward into that future. Christianity just gets better and better every day when it is lived as given to us through the life of Jesus and communicated to us through the Word of God. And so this is a great blessing also. Notice specifically in verse 13 that Jesus is identified as God in this verse. For the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. Okay. Um, there are some religions out there who do not teach that Jesus is God. They teach that He is a created being. And that is not true. This is one particular verse in the Bible that teaches Jesus' divinity. And so it would be a good one to remember if you come in contact with individuals like that. And so Jesus is our great God and Savior. And uh, Paul does not mince words here in that regard. So... Of course, we know there are other passages as well, such as John chapter 1 and verse 1, the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then verse 14 says, the Word became flesh. And so there's another great Bible verse that teaches the divinity of Jesus Christ. Verse 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed, and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. And so we look for Jesus, we also look back at Jesus. The book of Revelation expresses God multiple times as being the one who was, and the one who is, and the one who is to come. You know? And when we think about who Jesus is, being God Himself, He also shares in that description. And so as Paul talks to us about the present benefits of grace here in verses 11 and 12, we see Jesus, the God who is, in verse 13, looking for His return, His glory and superior. That's the God who will be. And then, who gave Himself for us, that's the God who was, right? So, who was, who is, and who is to come. Here is Jesus occupying all three of these positions in this short passage of Scripture here. He gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for Himself His own special people. Jesus didn't give Himself for us for no reason, right? This, these verses do not teach the concept of grace only, right? That's not taught in these passages. The concept of grace only or salvation by grace only is the concept that God will... And, and, it has to entail the salvation of all mankind. If you're saved by grace only, 
then everybody should be saved. And why is that? Because the grace of God has appeared to all men, according to verse 11. And if the grace of God has appeared to all men, then why shouldn't all men be saved if we're saved by grace only? But of course we know that not all are going to be saved. Jesus made that very clear in Matthew chapter 7 when He said, you know, wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And many who enter therein. So many are going to be lost, unfortunately. So we're not saved by grace only then. But we are saved by grace. Grace entails that we learn and that we grow and that we practice, that we deny ungodliness and worldly lust, that we live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, that we are redeemed from every lawless deed, and that we are purified, and that we are zealous for good works. And so grace then transforms us into a people who are going to live for God and who will keep on living for God. To abandon that life is to abandon God's grace because those things work together uh, for our salvation. So we're not saved by grace only and that's not God's intention. Jesus gave Himself for us for a reason, for a purpose. And that purpose is expressed here in verse 14, that He might redeem us from every lawless deed. Redeem us. In other words, buy us back. Well, think about this for a minute. If, if you were enslaved and you were redeemed out of that slavery, wouldn't you want to leave that situation and go into a situation where you were um, a freeman and then working for the person who redeemed you? That would just make sense, wouldn't it? What slave being redeemed would say, thanks for redeeming me, I'm going to go right back to my slavery? That doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? But that's exactly what some people say when they teach things such as once saved, always saved, for example. Where you can uh, just do whatever you want to do with your life because it doesn't matter. You, you're redeemed from those lawless deeds, but I'm going to go right back to those lawless deeds and keep living that way. Because once saved, always saved, right? At least that's the mentality. That's what people teach. But of course, that's not what the Bible teaches. We're redeemed from those lawless deeds, and then we are purified. Purified means to cleanse. It means to make clean, to, to, uh, to purge, to, uh, to take off the, the dross, and to refine so that one becomes something of value now instead of a wastrel, you know, who is just spending his life uh, pursuing selfish uh, pleasures and pursuits. So redeemed for every lawless deed and purified for himself. So we're purified for Jesus to be, to be his servant. To be his person, to be his brother, to be a child of God, to be a member of his kingdom, part of the royal family, as we've talked about in times past. Purified for himself, his own special people, zealous for good works. This expression, special people, comes from the Old Testament. It is that description that God gave the Israelites when they were coming out of Egyptian bondage. God told them that He had redeemed them so that they, that he, uh, they could be 
His own special people. Well, that special relationship that Israel had with the Lord God in the Old Testament, today, God has with His church, with those who have been redeemed by Jesus. That's the relationship that we have now. Israel of the Old Testament is no more national, physical Israel. But today, there is an Israel of God, but that Israel is the church. And it's not identified merely by genealogy anymore. It's identified by those who have identified with Jesus Christ, who have put him on in baptism. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And then verse 28. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. There is neither slave nor free. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And so it's in Jesus Christ that we have our identity today. And that's what it means to be His own special people. You, as a Christian, have a special relationship with Jesus. You have a special relationship with God. People in the world don't have that relationship. But you do. You have the opportunity to pray to God the Father through Jesus Christ. If I were to tell you today that I had a set of cards up here and each one of these cards were to give you a special relationship with the President of the United States so that if you were to take this card to Washington, D.C., you could walk in the front door of the White House and get an immediate hearing with the President, whoever that might be. And they're good for all times. You, know, you would have a special relationship with them. Because not everybody else has that relationship. Well, the Christian has a special relationship with God the Father. When he goes in prayer to God the Father, those prayers are mediated by his Son, Jesus Christ, and they are heard. So we have a special relationship because we're a special people. And then we are to be zealous for good works. Zealous for good works. I don't know that a Christian who understands his relationship with God the Father and his relationship with Jesus Christ, I don't know that that Christian couldn't be zealous for good works. When we really understand what we have in the church, with God's grace, with the forgiveness of sins that Jesus bestows upon us through His blood, that continual cleansing that John talks about in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. The wonderful hope that we have, the redemption that we have, the purity that we have, the special relationship that we have. How could we not want to give ourselves to Him in maintaining good works and loving Him with all of our heart, soul, and mind. How can we not want to do that? I don't know. It would be like husband and wife being married and then neither one wanting to do anything for the other. I mean, absolutely nothing. Yesterday, my wife went shopping and she came home and, and she had groceries. And, you know, she's not here, so I can talk about her right now. She's not the tallest person in the world. And so she needed some help putting things up on the top shelf. And she said, would you put this, I need, this needs to go up there. 
Would you do it? I said, sure. I wanted to do that. I wanted to help her. Because she's my wife. We have a special relationship with each other. Nobody else. She wouldn't ask anybody else to do that. I promise you. Just me. And so I did. But I want to do things for her. She wants to do things for me. You know, I'm not saying that that happens all the time, but I'm saying it happens a lot. And that's the case <coughs> with uh, special relationships. Yes? In reality, you have to say that. Well, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's true. Um, you do, there are benefits to be gained from doing the... Uh, <coughs> The good things that Jesus wants us to do, that, that is true. Any other co thoughts or comments? Look at Galatians chapter 6. It says uh, for us to do good to all of them. Absolutely. And then it puts another phrase, especially those who have household faith. Right. So we're, we're obligated and appreciative to do good to everyone who comes in contact with That's right. That's right. And so being zealous of good works is not limited to just what we do amongst ourselves here in the auditorium on Sunday morning, right? It's not limited to that. It includes that, no doubt. But we are to be zealous of good work everywhere we go. We have, I mentioned in the opening prayer, Tomorrow is the beginning of school for New Boston. I know it starts, when does it start in Redwater? Next week? The 19th. The 19th, okay. Redwater starts the 19th. When does Hook start? Thursday. Thursday. Hook starts Thursday. Okay, so we got a lot of people here who are in the schools. You know, good works can extend to that. It can extend to, to working in the schools. It can extend to being a good example, a positive example to that child who... Maybe it doesn't have such a great home life, you know. Um, good works are to be done by us everywhere we go. It, it infuses our life. Yes. And so when, when we see zealous for good works here, we're not just talking about um, in the church building or on the grounds or something like that. We're talking about everywhere we go being zealous for good works. And um, even in the workplace where we go out to work, we want to be zealous for good works. You know, Christian brings something to the workplace that the non-Christian does not have. Yes, ma'am. That's a great point. That's a great point. Um, we we do these things because we are saved, um, not in as a uh, checklist or something like that to um, earn salvation. Right? That's not why we do. Okay. Any other thoughts or comments? Well, Paul's talking about the example of Christ here in Titus two, as well as his doctrine things that he taught and left for all of us his disciples is that uh, we ought to be zealous of good works. Yes. Look at his example. We ought to be uh, acting in love. Again, his example. Uh, we ought to be um, convinced that nothing that we do good is in vain. Uh, we ought to be convicted of that to the point that we're not going to stop no matter what. Great thoughts. All right, let's look at verse 15. Speak these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one despise you. Again, Paul giving instruction to Titus on how he is to take the teaching and then disseminate it to others. 
He is the local evangelist, local preacher. He is to speak these things on a regular basis. Uh, exhort, the word exhort means to encourage, to build up, um, and to rebuke with all authority. And the word rebuke means to correct, to um, reprimand even sometimes. But of course that is to be done with love and with patience and a gentle way. With all authority. The authority is in the Word of God. And if Titus and any gospel preacher is speaking the Word of God, it is to be done with all authority. Because it's the Word of God that has the authority within it. When I speak the Word of God, I speak with God's authority to say those things. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Uh, 1 Peter 4, 11, I believe it is. And in that regard, as the gospel preacher and teacher is standing up and preaching the Word, he's not preaching his opinion. He's not giving advice, you know, like an advice columnist and saying you can take it or leave it. He is representing the God of heaven when he speaks those things. And when God is speaking to us through the gospel preacher, we need to listen to the message. Not because of anything special in the preacher or the messenger, but because he is setting forth God's word. And that's important that we listen from that point of view. Let no one despise you. Um, don't allow negative attitudes to prevent you from doing the work that needs to be done, more or less. It's what Paul is saying here. And of course, there's plenty of negative attitudes that will make themselves known in many different ways. So, all right, any thoughts before we move on to chapter 3? Let me go ahead and hand out these handouts uh, and then we'll start looking at chapter 3 together. Verses 1 through 8. Church, we are moving in. Oh, wonderful. And That's great. I watched them and I thought, 
the teaching of Jesus Christ, we are to obey government. So what happens when the IRS sends you a letter that says that you owe past taxes? Well, you get out the checkbook, right? <laughs> and you start writing a check because that's the government. And we're supposed to obey the government. Don't necessarily like that, all right? I don't know that Paul says you have to like it, uh, but you do have to obey. And so that's all that's, that's required there. So we're to be subject to rulers and authorities. That's not only federal government, mind you, but also state government, local governments, whatever, you know, say you're a, a local business owner, well, that means you've got to comply with all the local codes of construction or, or of uh, per permits of one sort or another that may be needed or required to do whatever it is that, that you want to do as a local business owner. Those permits are part of the process of being subject to government, you know. And uh, so there's many things. Uh, making sure, you know, nowadays uh, water and trash are owned and controlled by local government and different things like that. And so that would be a way to be subject to the local government, you know, paying your water bill, paying your water bill, um, complying with whatever instructions they give in regard to setting the trash in the right place, right? Not opening your neighbor's mailbox, you know. That's a federal offense. <laughs> I don't know that anybody here would do that. I, I don't do it. But uh, that's just something that is not permitted, even though it's right there. There was one time when, I'll tell you a story quick here at the end of the class, we were handing out uh, flyers for our gospel meeting in another location, and uh, some of the younger participants in the campaign uh, stuck those flyers in the mailboxes. Well, that's against the law. You're not supposed to do that. Yeah. We got a call from the post office reminding us that those mailboxes were reserved for uh, federal postage only. And I was like, I don't know if there was a mail or email. And was talking about, yes, sir. Yes, I understand. We will make sure our young people know that. Family. We're very sorry that happened. You know. So uh, there's another way that we are subject to the rulers and authorities. All right? Uh, so to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, obedience is certainly one of the teachings of the New Testament. We are to obey God. We are to obey Jesus Christ. We are to obey the elders. Should they decide to give us specific instruction that needs to be obeyed, we are to obey that. Uh, we are to obey the Lord's teaching. Uh, wherever we find ourselves in service to others, we are to subject ourselves to those others uh, and obey. Obedience is something that is necessary. And so that's something that uh, we must uh, constantly work on. We don't necessarily like to obey because it means taking our own will out of the equation. But obedience is one of the things that we're absorbing today. All right, we're out of time. Thank you so much for your good comments today. And we will pick up here. And don't forget your handouts next week. I may only make a few. So bring them back. All right, thank you so much.